Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Hello, today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Stefan Hell, Director of the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry at Göttingen and the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg. He shares how we stay motivated after receiving the Nobel Prize. This didn't stop me actually from, from enjoying the, the idea or, or, or having the pleasure of just getting some sharper and sharper and sharper and better and better and better. How he spends time with his family. The youngest is seven and a half. You know what I did last night? Actually, or in the afternoon as well, I, he wants to become a professional soccer football player. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I played football with him and why he doesn't think of himself as a microscopist. I was interested in sorting out a physics problem, and that's how I see myself. Um, and the physics problem was that you couldn't say, see details below the diffraction barrier. And I wanted to sort out that, um, that physics problem, nothing else. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York, and today I'm joined by Stefan Hell from Max Planck on today's Microscopist. Stefan, hello, how are you today? Hi, how are you? I'm oh, good, thank you. Uh, I, I was I always do a little bit of background, you kind of feel obliged to do a bit, even though obviously I know you really well. And I noticed that you're up for an award recently. And what I thought was really amazing was that the other, the other winners were for mRNA and the vaccines. <clears throat> Tell me more about that. That microscopy, mRNA, it just shows the importance of microscopy, but tell me more about the award. How important is <laughs> yeah. this? Yeah, uh, one, one might tend to believe that microscopy is as important as mRNA technology. <laughs> well, um, well, I, I might think so. Many people who watch this uh, interview might think so as well. Um, yeah, it's um, it's called the Werner von Siemens Ring, and um, it's a technology award. It's mainly given to um, uh, engineers and scientists in Germany who have had a substantial impact in the uh, development of important technologies. And uh, I would say the most famous person who got it was actually Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was the, was the person who came up with the idea of of um, building rockets to fly to, to the moon, actually. And he was in charge of the Apollo, Apollo program in the United States. And uh, so that, that's a very famous person, but many others, of course. And of course, currently, the most famous people arguably are the, the mRNA people like, uh, like Uslim Turishi and um, uh, Ur Shahin and, and the rest, um, Kathleen uh, Kariko and so on. And yourself. I'm very proud. I'm proud that that that, that, can, that I, I can be in the same uh, award ceremony and kind of share the prize with, with them. Of course, everyone gets a ring, and the ring is not something that you're supposed to wear on your finger. That's what I've been told. It's something that you put on display somewhere in your on a shelf, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, but it's a big, big, big honor. I can't say if it's a ring, that sounds like a really small prize for <laughs> something that's so big. How did you display something so small? <laughs> well, um, I suspect it's not that small as you might think because you're not supposed to wear it. But I can tell you after I got it. So I, I received it on December 13, you know. So so I don't know um, what it will look like. And I think it's a kind of secret. They usually make up something so that it kind of fits to the science and to the technology achievement you've had. So while well Storm prizes obviously the big thing in the room is obviously your Nobel prize as well how big a surprise was that when that was announced um so your question was whether it was a surprise or not um actually this is actually the phone where I took the call yeah yeah so that's where they called and um um yeah I was I didn't anticipate that they would give the prize for many many reasons um at least not at that uh, in that year so I thought it's still to, I shouldn't say controversial. It wasn't controversial, but kind of sort of, you know, I felt there are many other things that, that could be given the prize to. Um, so in that sense, it was a surprise. And also I felt that 
that the 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 field was not at the time so mature as I felt it should be, and 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 you know for very good reasons. I had I had been working with my people already at that time on minflux, as a matter of fact. So right. I knew that I knew that I knew that um, so the 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 twenty thirty nanometers which were possible at that time in twenty fourteen are not the end of the story. I knew it will be in the end it will be better. It will be two three four nanometers or so. And so I thought naively, from my perception, I'm not done. You know, I still have to get another factor of ten of improvement, and and that is possible. That I I felt it is possible, um, um, having worked on mini flux. And this is this is this all added to the psychology that it's not done. You know, there's more work to be done, and then after the work is finished, then you give the price. Um, and so in that sense, I was surprised. I was not surprised. Um, um, there's um, in, in as much as I knew that many people considered the field for a price. And that was very obvious to me. And I can tell you why it was obvious to me, because I was invited many times to Sweden to give talks. I was invited in, 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 in 2007 to give a talk. Um, and, and, and the people in the, in the audience, I mean, um, they were from the Nobel Committee in physics, by the way, not chemistry, physics. And they very openly said to me, well, this is about, this is about, um, yeah, in the Nobel Prize, more or less. They didn't say we are considering you for a Nobel Prize, but, but one, of, one of the people there <laughs> said to me, you know, who is paying for the dinner that we are having now? I said, no idea. And then he said, Mr. Nobel. <laughs> and so it was very obvious, yeah, in a way that, that, that it is about, say, judging whether the field, whether the work is worthy a Nobel Prize at some point. And then I got invited in 2008, I got invited in 2009, in 11, I spoke to the Academy and then 12 to the Academy and so on. So I knew that, that um, there is a kind of the interest um, in the field. So in that sense, it was not that much of a surprise. Well, I, 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 it was really interesting to hear how that has, just how the sort of the, I, I don't know they they do their assessments and inviting over to Sweden and stuff, and I assume with the others also. You you said that you weren't finished, so I'm I'm I I, I I'm pretty confident I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it for the general audience anyway. <laughs> you've done it. You've you've now won the Nobel Prize for physics. Then chemistry, chemistry. I got it for chemistry, chemistry. Sorry, chemistry. Nobel Prize for chemistry. Yeah. Then you've not finished. You still got. You're working on mini flux. How? How? How do you stay motivated? Did you think? Oh, did that uh, relate you a bit? Because, that odd. Does you it, think? Yeah, it's a very good question because um, the Nobel Prize actually has not been a motivation for me, and that's why the the Nobel Prize didn't. Didn't, didn't end my motivation, you know, didn't put cut cut my um, motivation back. I mean, I was kind of really fascinated. I, I must say it's a true fascination for the idea to, to get the highest possible spatial resolution. It's like, it's something childish. You, you can say it's childish, yeah? So I, I just want to know how far can you go? And of course, on this path, there was a Nobel, that's right. Yeah, but this did, didn't stop me actually from, from enjoying the, the idea or, or, or having the pleasure of just getting things sharp and sharp and sharp and better and better and better. Um, and that's why um, there, there was one, has never been a motivation problem. And actually one of my colleagues noted, noted um, after I won the prize said, come on, it's over. Why, why are you so keen to get these things done and say, it's over? I say, what, what do you mean it's over? Well, you got the Nobel, what, what do you want? I say, well, come on, this is, this, is not, this is not about Nobel. It's about just doing it and, and, and getting somewhere. And, and of course, I was motivated, I'm, I have to be very honest with you, I want to do, to do something that really goes down um, uh, um, uh, in the history of science. That was a motivation, yes, yes. I had this childish, say, pleasure of finding things out and 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 doing it um, as much as as possible, pushing it to the very end. Yeah, but uh, but of course, I was also motivated doing things that really go down in history. So, thinking of childish things, 
if I take you back to when you were around 10 years of age, in that sort of age, so the, the sort of early, earliest recollection of wanting to be something as a career, yeah. what sort of job was it you wanted as a child? Actually, honestly, I have always been interested in doing science. So I've, I was fascinated with people who, who I like, like rocket scientists, and astronauts and of course I watch science fiction movies and this kind of things I mean um, as you know I, I grew up in communist Romania but still be, we could see undubbed uh, say American uh, sci science fiction movies and this kind of things and of course it was I mean I still remember um, the landing on the moon and, and these kind of things and people People, of course, build rockets and, and, and all this stuff. And, and clearly, I was fascinated. I'm part of that generation that was fascinated by, wow, um, um, say, just, um, yeah. So, Getting... so was, if, if, you, if I just concentrate on the start and watching the American TV back when you were in Romania, was it Star Trek or Star Wars? What was your preference? Um, it was Star Trek. Um, uh, but, but 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 I do not remember many details, honestly. But um, it was Star Trek and some other some some kind of science fiction. I don't know what they were called. And um, uh, but but just the notion that there is a world outside our own world. Yeah, there is there is there is new planets, all kind of stars, maybe all kind of creatures or whatever. Yeah, aliens and so on. And maybe we are not just by ourselves and. And during my lifetime, that's how I felt as a child. One should be able to discover something that is totally unheard of, totally outlandish or so. And I could be part of it in, in one way or the other. Of course, I didn't end up as an astronaut or as, as a rocket scientist or so. But I think the fascination of, 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 of being able to discover something, that was actually instilled very early on um, in, in my childhood. So obviously you went through and then went to university and did a degree, I presume, in physics orientated physics, physics, degree plain that. physics. Yeah. Yeah. And when did your so so obviously you're not in rocket science. Uh, didn't take a rocket scientist to work out you're not in rocket science. Uh, what is it? Uh, what what brought you into microscopy? Yeah, it's actually a very funny story and um, um, it's completely different. If if I'm if I'm very honest and, and to you, um, and, and I, I've said that uh, a couple of times, I, I'm not a microscopist, you know? I don't see myself as a microscopist, by all means. You know, a microscopist is a person who is fascinated by seeing small things or by different microscopes. Yeah. I was interested in sorting out a physics problem. And that's how I see myself. Um, and the physics problem was that you couldn't say, see details below the diffraction barrier. And I wanted to sort out that, um, that physics problem, nothing else. And this is also why I got not sidetracked by other things like um, optimizing lenses or optimizing the immersion medium or, or having better mounting media. Of course, I always understood the importance of that. Say, say my first paper actually that was really important was about um, uh, aberrations and aberration induced by refractive index mismatches, something very microscopy uh, related. But, uh, but as a matter of fact, I was interested in sorting out the problem. So how did I get into microscopy? Um, actually, I, I signed up with, um, with a professor who was actually a, a solid state physicist. And in solid state physicist in Heidelberg, where I studied physics, just physics, um, he he had founded um, a high-tech company. And um, that high, sort of high-tech company, they specialized in building laser scanners. Laser scannings for ophthalmology, for mm -hmm. um, computer chip inspection, uh, for biological imaging, and for other things. And I was asked, uh, as a part of my PhD thesis, I, I was asked to, to look into um, the computer chip inspection thing. And so, um, I used a laser scanner, which was built by that company. It was called Heidelberg Instruments. And I, I, just, I just took pictures, confocal pictures, laser scanning pictures of silicon computer chips. 
And so my job was to find out whether, um, whether the lithography process worked well enough or whether there were problems and so on. And I found this extremely boring. I was so, actually it was devastated. I was just about to give up uh, my PhD thesis. And, um, um, and because there was new, no new physics in it, you know, I mean, the only thing I did is I took pictures and then compared with, with pre-recorded electron microscopy data. And, um, and then I've, I thought about it. What would be, say, the only what would be the problem, problem or interesting problem that would still be left in microscopy that would be worthwhile pursuing from a physicist's viewpoint? And so I found it's a diffraction barrier. That's how I got into this. And then, then I felt at some point that, yeah, uh, the, uh, breaking the diffraction barrier that would be the only interesting physics problem that is left, because microscopy, light microscopy per se, that's the physics of the 19th century. That's boring. That's that's. Um, um, and that's how I, how I got started actually. And, and you may say, okay, um, so of course everyone can say that's the interesting problem, but I became at some point convinced that it's worthwhile pursuing because what I had realized is that those scientists, the, the scientists of those days in, in the eighties who looked into microscopy were not real physicists. I don't want to insult anyone, but, but they were mostly technicians or engineers or biologists who didn't have a qualification to look into the problem. And, um, and since I was interested in doing basic physics, I felt that if, if a person, uh, a physicist who is interested in basic physics looks into the diffraction problem, he or she may find a solution because physicists, they look at other things. They look at solid state physics, or they look into nuclear physics or particle physics or uh, the grand unification of forces or whatever, but not microscopy because microscopy is boring. That's the 19th century physics. And that, that was actually a big insight. And so I decided to look into it. And right I was, yeah. You, you say microscopy is boring. I think if you to ask many undergraduates about microscopy, they would probably think it's boring. Because they don't realize a lot of the images that they're seeing in their lectures, the materials are formed by a microscope in quite a cool way. I, I worry there's a disconnect sometimes. The pictures are, are given and they're so used to CGI, they, they, they disengage with how the images of watching live cells, things inside live cells actually happen. So, you know, I, I, bet, I bet now biology is suffering a little bit from the same thing until they start to do their PhDs and start to use the higher yeah. end. I mean, Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying actually microscopy is boring, but from a physicist's viewpoint who wants to do some yeah. basic physics, that was not the um, um, uh, problem that at that time looked interesting. And so, so the, you may ask me, why did I look? Why did I sign up with that professor? And why did I? Why did I? Why did I do that PhD work, which was boring? I mean, it's it's crazy. It's very simple. Um, I was born in Romania, as I mentioned, and and I Im immigrated into Germany, and um, um, of course, I was interested in doing basic physics. But but at some point, um, um, I felt that if I'm doing say particle physics or something like that, I may not get a job as a physicist. There was a, there was an unemployment among physicists um, in those days. And I felt I have to do something that, that gets me a job. So I have to do something applied. This is why I signed up actually with this professor because I had set up a company and that's how I got into the company because I, I, I want to do something um, that, that gets me a job with, with IBM or so, computer chips and, and the rest of it. That was the motivation. And that was, in a sense, it was the wrong decision because I did something that I really hated, you know, is boring, say, push, pushing a button, taking a picture. And then, and then I was totally frustrated. I, I can tell you, I was just about to, to drop out. I was so frustrated. And if I hadn't gotten that idea of, of or that vision of, of breaking the diffraction barrier, I would have dropped my thesis for sure. Yeah. And that <laughs> kind of kept me going. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that well, yeah, history would have been very different at that point for many of us. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. You said you obviously you moved over from Romania to Germany with your family uh, as, yeah. as a yeah. child. How old with were my you? parents? Yeah, yeah, yeah I was 15 you years old. 15, 15. How did you find the move? Uh, it wasn't that difficult uh, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, um, I was born in Romania, but um, but we were German ethnics because my ancestors had immigrated from southwestern Germany 
to that part of the world, which at that time was Austria, as a matter of fact, part of the Austrian Empire um, in the 18th century. And so we spoke a kind of ancient um, um, an, um, a German dialect, like, like the Amish in the States, for example, very, very similar to, to the Amish. Um, and and so, so I spoke German. So it, that was not a big, big, um, big change. So in that sense, it was even easier for me because in, in Romania, well, um, the official language was Romanian, of course, and that was a foreign language for me. Um, and secondly, it wasn't that difficult because I had a very, very good school education um, uh, in, in Romania. So in physics and mathematics, um, the only problem I had, I didn't speak English, not a single word, more or less. The only English was that, that, that I spoke was actually from what I picked up from, from non-dubbed um, movies and, and things like that. Um, and then I, I, I had French as a foreign language, first foreign language. So I managed to get my high school leaving certificate with French as a first foreign language. And that, that was a big problem for me as well. And that's part of the of how I got into microscopy. Because of course in Germany you can study physics in German. So lectures in German, everything. But once you reach a certain level, of course, you have to read papers, and papers are in English. And one of the reasons why I went into this, um, uh, why I signed up with this technology professor is because um, this technology kind of PhD thesis didn't require any English because it was very technology. Now, I'm serious, I'm that yeah. serious. At the, time, at the time I did my PhD thesis, I couldn't have had this interview with you. Yeah, and then I had to learn it more or less, yeah. So it's self-taught through the reading of the papers. And, and, yeah, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, the the conferences and everything. Oh, you're in, well. I know you're still not hyper confident in English, but your English is excellent, and, and well, as yeah. people listening will know, it, it is it is excellent. That's it's quite an interesting thought, you know. Yeah, like yeah. An English native speaker, it, we're very fortunate. Uh, but I like I like the fact that you try to almost dodge learning English by choosing something where no, you I'm actually, <laughs> and then. <laughs> embraced it <laughs> i wish i had spent some more time on it and learned it properly you know um of course i've managed that, that's clear but um but i think it's um it, it's it's a part you know what i'm trying to say is actually we all live lives in the end and of course i ended up with this microscopy and eventually even with a nobel prize and a part of a part of the equation of getting there is some say very unfortunate or unfortunate circumstances like not speaking English, you know, uh, or or doing something just for the sake of, of of getting a job afterwards, and so that that was really part of the part of the equation. So that's why I, I got into this technology thing, into microscopy, which was the 19th, 19th century physics and boring, and and then finally, what came out a discovery, if you want, yeah, you never know. So we all have to live lives, and it's. And um, and our say and scientific discoveries are very much entangled with our personal life. So, just just thinking of uh, that, you know, it, it sounds like you've, you, you've obviously made choices and you haven't regretted those choices. You've come close to regretting those choices, but then actually you've taken advantage and made the best of it, and, and obviously moved forward. Is there any time that you actually regret in your career? No, zero. That's a good answer, isn't it? No, uh, honestly, no, nothing. Okay, what has been the best time of your career? What sort of the best, was it back in your undergraduate, PhD, postdoc? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, when has been the most exciting time, best, most fun time? PhD time was was tough because, um, because of course, I, I, I did it well. I got, got um, we get grades in Germany for for uh, for our PhD work, and I got the highest um, uh, grade I could have gotten. Yeah, there's no doubt. So I was okay um, in in that sense. In the end, I, I managed to get something. I get some data and 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 uh, and publish something uh, not in in a in a <laughs> not in a peer reviewed SPIE journal, by the way. Um, but um, what I enjoyed most actually was finding out that it's possible to overcome the diffraction barrier. And, and, and I realized that um, uh, when I was in Finland, um, I, I had this gut feeling much earlier on, much earlier on. And I started out with four pi microscopy. Why did I do that? Because, and I had to, I had to get a foot into the door, yeah? 
And so, so and the four pi kind of thing was considered as technologically very, very challenging, but physically sound. So no one could argue about that. So it was physically completely sound. And of course, it was thinkable to get a spatial resolution that is better by a factor of four in the in the z direction or z direction. But it was um, it was was hard to do, but technologically sound. But the other thing, like breaking the diffraction barrier in a lateral direction, overcoming um, Abe's, so to speak, um, um, limitations, that that was considered outlandish. You know, I mean, many people claimed that. So we now underestimate that. But there have been many people around in the 20th century who said that I can do that. I can get a better spatial resolution. And and not all of them were nuts. I mean, there is, for example, this um, Toraldo principle. You may have heard of it, yeah. Toraldo was an um, uh, Italian. Toraldo di Francia was an Italian physicist, and he came up with a principle to overcome the diffraction barrier in a lateral direction. And he made a paper about this. Um, and there was a so-called Lukosz principle. Also, he made a paper about this. But at the, at the end of the day, no one could get a picture. You know, it didn't work. Even if you think about it, of course, I thought about it. So is that a viable option? And I realized it would never work. And so all these guys who made, say, proposals for breaking the diffraction barrier, they didn't come up with something that really works. That's why people were so skeptical. <clears throat> so you, you went over to Finland, to Turku. Yeah. Uh, well, so that, that, that's another big change. Yeah. Well, not because I, I, I Turku actually, it's kind of an odd city actually. It's a, it's a, Have you been there? Yes, yeah, and actually, kind of, I don't know. It, it was, it, it wasn't typical Scandinavian. I didn't feel when I was there. Yeah, since you asked me what was my happiest time of my professional life, I think that some stretches in in Turku were actually. Uh, quite actually, I must say, um, I was quite happy because, you know, during my PhD thesis, um, I, I was very frustrated because I did things that, that I felt are boring. I didn't actually want to do them. I didn't just out of, um, out of this feeling that I need to have to get a job or social security or so. And, but in Finland, I mean, since I worked on the break of the diffraction barrier, I did the things that I really wanted to do. So, so I felt very satisfied about what I did. And so um, then I got this that idea and it was, it was a fascinating idea. And so I was very happy about that. Um, so uh, that, that was definitely a, a, a quite, quite happy part of my professional life, yes. Uh, of course, uh, so of course, Turkey is also the home of Europe, well, for the life science, uh, microscopy side for yeah. imaging. It, it, yeah, that came later actually. So they, yes. they had just started. Uh, to invest in biotechnology in those days, and, and they, they set up a, a so-called center for biotechnology. And um, actually, it was a very, um, how should I put it, um, supportive atmosphere. And um, so Finland was just about to join the European Union at that time, so they were very much, they started to open up themselves towards Europe. You know, Finland was something in between um, the communist bloc and, 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 and the Western world, and so they were just about to orient themselves towards Europe. And, and so there was a, a Nokia became a, a very important company at that time. And so, um, so Finland kind of opened up to the world. I'm going to change tack. I'm just looking down here. <laughs> you then went through to EMBL, uh, Heidelberg, and obviously now to Max Planck, where you are today. And you, you talk about 4Pi, which is certainly, I, I met you, I think, for the first time, you won't remember this for sure, uh, in 2001. So I was a student on a EMBL, uh, an EMBO course at yeah, EMBL, yeah. uh, and you were lecturing uh, about four pi, which as a biologist, that was well, my biochemist, that was kind of mind blowing. But I, I came down at the end to ask more questions because I needed, to, I wanted to understand it properly, not just assume. Yeah, uh, and that was cool. But from four pi, you went on to stead, you went to GSD, you went to Resolve, you went to three photon, you got Minflux, you got Minstead. Yeah, what's your favorite technique? You see, I don't see it like that, Peter. I mean, it's very understandable that you see it from the technique viewpoint. Um, uh, but as I said, I mean, I, I wouldn't call myself a microscopist. Why? Because I'm interested in the principle. I'm interested in the concept. I want to sort out a problem. And so I'm looking into what makes it tick, you know? What but is which, the essence? Which, to achieve, which one's 
have you got most pride in then out of all of those? Which one is the the, the maybe the biggest step or the, the one you're most yeah. proud of? Having realized, I tell you what, what it is. I'm proud of have, having been the first person who realized that the way to overcome the diffraction barrier is to look into the state transitions of dyes, to, to just see the dye as a facilitator for overcoming the diffraction barrier. And that is a, a very, very big step because if you if you look into, um, um, say, the history of development of microscopy in those days, people thought the way to overcome the diffraction barrier um, is to squeeze the light through tiny holes, near field optics. Eric Betzig had worked on that. So Eric Betzig's strategy was to, to change the way the waves propagate, so the, the light propagates, mm -hmm. put it through tiny holes. I had a completely different approach. Look into the dye, turn it on and off. That's the way uh, to go. And this is actually what, what turned out to be the decisive step. And so I'm proud of that, yes. I, I, so I guess we could, uh, I, I, can I say this? I don't know if I can say this. Uh, the man who brought donuts into science. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's not, <laughs> yes, I, I know I'm associated with donuts. That's, but it's, it's, not, it's not a donut, you know? <laughs> it is, no, no, serious, uh, joking, joking. But um, it's, it's the fact that you take the dye and see the dye as a facilitator for a resolution. Uh, yeah, and so as my chemist, so fluorescence is certainly for my biochemistry is sort of went to biophysics very fluorescence. I quite, I just love the manipulation. Yeah, I mean, look, look at the stat paper. Why is the stat paper so important? Yeah, it's because it has the transitions of the states in it because it has, it says, okay, I'm using the states of the dye, yeah, to, to make a sharper picture in the end. So I'm turning it off. And this on off, of course, is the key to all super resolution methods that, that we know so far, whatever they are called. I mean, call them palm, storm, stat, resolve, pain, whatever, min flux. In the end, it boils down to that from a physicist viewpoint. From a biologist viewpoint, of course, it all looks different. I understand that. But if you look at it from, from the basic science um, perspective, it, it boils down to the same principle. I'm going to change tack a little bit now. What do you do outside of work to chill out? Oh, um, you may know or not know, we have four children and the youngest is seven and a half. You know what I did last night? Actually, or in the afternoon as well, I, he wants to become a professional soccer, football player. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I played football with him. And you're not aching now? Sorry? And you're not in pain or aching or any muscle? No, 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 I'm not. I'm not. I'm actually well trained, I must say. <laughs> I, I, I do a lot of hiking or, or also some running, you know, up the hills here. Um, I would say altogether about maybe seven, eight hours per week at least. But running and hiking? Uh, well, I mean, not serious hiking in a sense, like, but but just just going up the hills and and um, and uh, yeah, that's that's what I like. And so I, I think I'm I'm in good shape. So the next uh, Elmi meeting that you attend, we'll need to get you on the football team for the uh, academics versus <laughs> companies game. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, <laughs> you could try. Yeah, <laughs> get a free top. Yeah. Is there is there a football team? I didn't know that there is one. Yeah, yeah. So on a on the opening day where it's the sort of core the core facility, so the, the pre congress workshops, there's an afternoon football game where the the academic team take on the commercial team. So you have all the different companies playing together. Uh, it's a really nice way to break down those barriers between A, the companies themselves, but the companies and the academics. It just brings everyone sort of together for a bit of fun. Uh, well, yeah, fun-ish. Obviously, there's a bit of competition in there. Uh, I would say the academics are currently winning. I think, oh, no, no, they might have leveled it this year. Yes, Amsterdam next year or, or Netherlands. Uh, come on over and join the team. Okay. <laughs> it is good. So what about other hobbies besides uh, the hiking, playing football with your son? Yeah, I mean, um, well, that, that's basically, a, that's basically, I, I really enjoy it and spend a lot of time. I'm, I, I have a personal trainer as well, so I'm, I'm doing workout, yeah. So at least twice a week or so. So, okay, if you have football and, and you do have a PT and, and, and do these kind of things. I mean, that easily fills up your week with the job, of course. The physical exercise is quite important to you then. 
health for health, I guess, and well being. Yeah, and also for well being and fe feeling healthy and, and the rest of it, sure. Yeah. And do your children go on hikes with you? Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. And I, I liked it very much because, you know, you can have discussions and, and um, the oldest is um, close to about 18. Yeah. And you, I have discussions with him about all kinds of things, um, politics. I mean, he spent a year in, in, in the States um, uh, on, in, a, in a high school just and of course, uh, I'm trying to to teach them to have a more global perspective on things and 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 try to explain the world to them <laughs> as much as I can, of course. And um, so I enjoyed it very much, you know. Now, if you try being in the UK right now, I think politics is what everyone knows. <laughs> I just heard you're getting the new um, prime minister today. Quite exceptional times, I've got. To... Yeah, yeah. Everywhere, uh, everywhere. <laughs> Wherever you look, it's very exceptional. Uh, it, it is globally, it is just, uh, I, I guess for the youngsters, this will be their norm. Whereas I think we've lived through 20, 30 years of yeah, that, that, riot and yeah, policy between actually just not really going in big steps, but it's quite different at the moment. Thinking on uh, the best times, what about the most difficult times you've had in your career, the most challenging yeah. times? Professionally, you mean? From, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, several times I thought I would drop out of science. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that is true. Actually, even after I had this, that idea, people didn't want to believe it. And there were people who, yeah, I don't want to mention names. They, they actively fought against it. They, they, they kind of said, this guy is exaggerating. This guy is just making a big fuss because he wants to have a job or, or something and don't believe him. Some even said, two famous people actually, um, I, of course I won't mention a name, they, they claimed privately and even in writing that my data are not reproducible. Um, it came out, how do I know? Because I, in one case, I can, I can honestly tell you, I applied for a job in in southern Germany, um, at a at a research institution at a university, and um, um, there were they had they considered two people, me and somebody else, and um, and then they asked for letters, and sent out let, um, requests for letters. Uh, that's that's quite normal, of course, if you if you if you, do, if you apply for such jobs, and and one of them, quite famous person in, in the field, microscopy field, wrote back that you shouldn't take this guy because um, his, his data is not reproducible. I mean, I don't know why he said that, but, and how do I know? <laughs> because the person actually in charge had to face a very tough decision, take the other person or me, and in the end decided to take me and, 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 and indicated that he get, got that letter and I could figure out even who he was. I never made it public, but this is just an example. That was tough, you know? If you, if you, if you, you cannot defend yourself, yeah? But, but there is a room around that your stuff is not reproducible um, or, or it's not true. And this development of super resolution as they call it now wouldn't lead anywhere. And this is all baloney and this kind of stuff. That's really hard. Then the alternative that you, you, you drop out of science because if you have such letters, of course, you never know. I mean, you can easily drop out of science if, if, if those letters are around. And those letters were written by established people. They, they must have, I, I can't believe they would have done it maliciously. They must have thought they were telling, they must have thought they were telling the truth. I, 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 I... Yeah, it is a mixture of them. It's, 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 um, I, uh, it's both, it's both malicious and, and believing in, in it. So I, you are right. I think these guys really thought that they are right. And of course, they had the intention of, of making sure that I wouldn't get a job because they felt competed. That was clearly the case. And so this is the ugly side of science and it really happens. And I, I'm saying why I'm saying this now without mentioning names, of course, I'm saying it, I, I wanna tell young people, if, if you have an interesting idea or, or you might face this ugly, um, ugly side of science. And so this is nothing that is unheard of. 
And even I, who became a Nobel laureate in the end, had to go through this pain. And in retrospect, I must say, if you do something that is truly revolutionary, yeah, it's very likely that you face something, unless it's a, it's a say, um, how should I call it? Um, an experiment that is just very simple and clear cut. But uh, like if you, if you discover nuclear fission or so, of course it's one experiment, and then it's instantly reproducible. But if it's a development, you know, where, which, which takes several steps, then it's very likely that you face resistance because people don't want it. Yeah, I put no, many no. people out of business in a way. I mean, look at the near field optics, people. I mean, I don't know, you may not remember that field, but being a physicist, I remember it very well. In the 90s, the notion was that the only way to go about res resolution is near field optics. And there were in Europe at least 10, 15, and, and worldwide about 40 groups who pursued that. I mean, they were not happy about it. When I came say, no, 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 near field is not a way to go. You do it just with the dye, okay? And just use normal uh, focused, focused light. Of course, they were not happy. I mean, grants and, and the rest of it and jobs and, and so on. It reminds me about when I talked to Richard Henderson and talking about using electron microscopy instead of x-rays and the x-ray community, not necessarily uh, welcoming it. Of course <laughs> or, or not. Open to it to start of with. Of course, he put them out of business to some extent, yeah? Sure. Yeah, but, but as with all, I, I guess, electric and petrol cars, you know, times change. Yes. It takes time. There's always skepticism because it's new, it's novel, and it's not proven. And it doesn't work straight away. It takes yeah. time to be developed. Actually, that, that's a good point, actually. A lot of your physics has now ended up in commercial products, which is vital. I think I think that I think that's yeah uh, it's the commercialization of your physics and, and the diffraction the break, breaking the diffraction break, that is enabled not necessarily you but for your your work to have had the end impacts how difficult is it to get it commercialized yeah um I think it's very important <clears throat> because um as you as you alluded to, actually, I set up in 2011 and 2012 two companies that are related, Aberio and Aberio Instruments. And my main motivation was to to um, um, to increase the speed of 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 how should I put it um, of use of wide usage of other technologies. Um, um, if you work with big companies, that makes sense, and 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 at, at times that, that may be the right choice, uh, no doubt about it. But of course, managerial decisions in big companies are very complicated and, and more time consuming. But if you set up a startup company and, and, and all the people who work there are your former students, then it's much easier because it, you can talk to them and, and, and so on. And that's, that's why I decided after having collaborated with a big company um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to commercialize it through a spin-off, a spin-out. And... Um, <clears throat> And, and I think that's very important because, um, uh, because take MinFlux, for example. So I had a basic idea for, for, for that, um, um, you call it technology, back in 2011 or so. I was, then I was very clear that this, 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 this is going to be very important. I was, was, very, uh, was very convinced about it. Okay, then it um, was published in 2016, okay? And the first commercial product came in 2020, 2021. And just four years between the first demonstration and in a paper in science and, and the co commercial product. And that's relatively fast. In a, in, a, in a big company, that would take six, seven years or so. And because there would be maybe one or two or three years until they, they decide that it's, 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 um, that's worthwhile pursuing and so on. So it always takes time. But small companies can make very quick decisions. And now there are many groups around the world um, who have access to the technology, at least 15 or 20 or so by now. I mean, only yeah, two years or less than two years after it became commercially available. And that makes the technology, um, um, of course, much, much, much more accepted because there are papers out there that uh, who, um, uh, 
um, um, showing that this is useful and so on. If if we would if we, we were the only ones who, who did that, of course, people would be skeptical and they could argue why is this good, why is this use, useful, and so on. So it's very very important to to disseminate the technology very quickly. But does that not drain a huge amount of effort uh, and create? I'd imagine there must be a lot of stress when it was starting up, and the fact the financial responsibilities. Yeah. Are, there must be highs and lows. Associated yes, with that. Um, but you know, I'm I'm of course I have shares, yeah, and I'm advising the company. So what I do actually, I I see the CEO once a week or twice a week. So on Saturdays usually, so we have a more or less like a jour fix or so where we meet up um, at at um, Saturdays at noon or something for two hours and and discuss discuss things. Um, and um, you know, um, of course it, it it took me some time, yeah, but it was. My hobby, so to speak. So I, I did it um, um, just uh, besides my job, and um, <clears throat> um, financial things not so much because having done my PhD work in a in a startup company, I learned it. I learned that it's good not to have VCs, and so I decided together with the other uh, founders. Um, not to take money from from financial markets or from a bank or something, but to kind of start say with a small amount of our own money. So we put together two hundred thousand euros um, and then build the first system. So the first system had a margin, of course, and with that margin we build the next system and so on. And and in this way, actually, we succeeded in setting up a company that now um, has over a hundred employees. Wow! Without without any penny from outside that's that's a true success story and so why did it work peter it's very unusual it worked because the people in the company had very unique skills they are, were extremely good they knew exactly what to do they were very well trained many work here at the max Planck with me or most of them uh, some of them had done phd somewhere else uh, one of them was in alberto diaspora's lab in uh, in uh, Genoa, the other one was in Sweden at Karolinska, but they came back and had a lot of experience and knew exactly what to do and then developed systems that are, as I believe, very useful. A hundred employees is huge. And and I, I'll point out for- Still growing, by the way, still growing, look, looking for people all the time, yeah. Four years to going from start to product, sounds like a long time, but I know in the, in the world of microscopy, certainly, it can be double that yeah. you know, to get it to an end product. Because some of the big companies, that, you know, there's a lot of reputation or everything has to be very polished. Get exactly. It out. Exactly. And it has the, the thing is, I mean, I can demonstrate something in the lab and show a picture and so on. And there is a the physical principle is demonstrated and so on. But it's a different story if you build something that can be used in a push button way by any biologist. So that that is totally a different different story. You know, think about all the pitfalls that could come up, and then and then of course um, it takes time. It takes time to build a system that is really robust and and, and works the way you want, oh, and the customer I'm gonna, wants. I'm going to change topics again. Yeah, and I'm going to ask some quick fire questions. Okay, so preference PC or Mac? Um, <laughs> PC, yeah because i'm used to it i like macs i must say so i like the philosophy behind apple and so to be very honest with you but uh, pc that's what i what i use that's okay mcdonald's or burger king <laughs> burger king i don't know why but it's burger king okay uh, well, what would you have if, well if you went there what would be off the menu on it um i have i haven't been to burger king for years and i haven't been to mac for years um I don't know what, what they have now. I, I I would take something, perhaps even something vegetarian, if they have something okay. like a like like a sort of a meat replacement or something. I would take that. I would try that. Okay, so I think no, I think oh gosh, who was it who was saying on there that actually it's, it's the new plant based one at Burger King that they yeah said, yeah exactly. I would I would try that. I like I like uh, trying out new things. Okay, coffee or tea? A uh, coffee, black. Okay, uh, espresso or americano? Uh, both, actually. I'm, I'm usually espresso, depending on depending on where I am. In in, in Italy, of course, um, uh, it's always espresso or so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Beer or wine? Um, actually, both. 
um, beer and wine. So 50% beer. But um, I like um, a beer without alcohol. I, I drink beer, but, but usually without alcohol and wine, of course, there is no wine that is non-alcoholic, but, um, but um, yeah, at times, with, if it's with alcohol, wine without alcohol, beer. Okay. Uh, chocolate or cheese? Say it again. Chocolate or cheese? Um, chocolate. Milk or dark? Milk. Oh, gosh, that's advice. Uh, <laughs> if you went to a conference, uh, and or, or even when you were you were taken out and it was uh, Nobel that was paying for it, uh, quite often you don't actually get to choose your food. Uh, it will be put in front of you, whatever it is. What would be the best thing someone could put in front of you? I what think you could, that's a result. I'm really pleased that that's what I've got. Um, I didn't get the question. So um, I, maybe I didn't understand you. Um, favorite, so, what's your favorite food? My favorite food? Ooh, actually, I don't have a favorite food. Um, I had a discussion for some reason two hours ago with somebody else. Um, so it, it, I eat anything, yeah? Unless it's it's obviously disgusting, but uh, but I don't have um, something that that I would regard this is my favorite food. Um, I eat pasta, I eat meat. I'm typically kind of sort of more inclined towards veg vegetarian, but but it's not that I wouldn't eat meat or something. Yeah. Okay. So I was going to ask, what is your least favorite food? What if someone was put in front of me? Go, I just I just can't eat that. Uh, no, I, I, I think um, I'm, I'm very easy. So, so I'm, I'm some smiling at people if they ask, oh, is there something that you don't eat or so? Is there something you, and especially in the States, you have this, you constantly get this question if you, if you are invited or you invite people, you have to ask them what, what they eat or what they don't eat. This is something that is very, yeah. yeah you are very, to very, yeah. Yeah, you're sounding very, very easy. Yeah, no problem. Are you Even in China, you know, I went to China a couple of times and you get all, all these interesting things like, I, I don't know what, you know, uh, chicken eyeballs or whatever. Well, I mean, it's, it's not what I would pick normally, but I wouldn't mind eating it if I had to. And usually presented very nicely, though. Helps. Early bird or night owl? Honestly, night owl, yeah. Night owl. Okay. Uh, book or TV? Hmm. Both, but I, I'd prefer a book if it's good, yeah. And what's yeah. The, what sort of literature, what sort of genre of book do you read? Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, well, sometimes I, I read um, books about, um, you know, political topics, you know, about what's going on in the world and how people see the development going on in the States or um, Europe or China or Russia or whatever. So, so sometimes um, it, um, I like it to get an angle, a different angle from somebody who has a different view on things. So it's not necessarily my own ideas, of course. Um, and um, I, I admit uh, three years back, I wanted to understand Trump a bit better. Yeah, the, the president at that time. I read the art of the deal just to see what kind of person is this. Yeah. So, well, you know, but yeah, it widens your, your, your angle. Yeah. I, 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 I tend to look at the front pages of most newspapers uh, across the spectrum to try and get. Yeah. That's uh, what I do too. The articles just to try yeah. and get some balance to every, because they're always feeding us one yeah. way or the other. It's hard to get neutrality. I think. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But of course, you you can read something without agreeing with somebody. Yeah, it's 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 um, it's um, very clear. And of course, but 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 it's I don't believe in black and white. You know, I mean, I don't believe in that. I think one has to look as a scientist. One one is geared towards understanding causal effects. What is cause? What is what is effect? And not this is good. This is bad. This guy is good. This guy is bad. I mean, this doesn't work. Um, it's not. It, it, this is this is not. And that's how we should see the world. So it's always interesting to see at different angles. Yeah. And, and then, you, of course, you can put things in perspective and come up with your own conclusion. That's what I like um, personally. No, that sounds, sounds very good. Uh, 
do you have when you watch tv is there any uh so i asked richard henderson this what his tv vice was in other words what tv would he not really want to admit to watching and then he admitted to watching breaking bad which actually wasn't that bad do you have any tv i watch tv you know i watch soccer games that's not a vice <laughs> no 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 that's what i do you know you that's about the only tv that i watch yeah <laughs> so um, sometimes news but i don't I, I actually what i do is um every morning when i get here to the office or so uh, i'm i have a um uh, um um uh, espresso or something black of course and i'm skimming actually through the um um three four major newspapers american swiss german british so i have subscriptions to a couple of them and then, um, yeah, I'm, I'm checking them out. <laughs> what is your, uh, do you have a favorite film, favorite movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is one um, that, you know, it kind of reminds me of my Finland days. Um, it's called Night on Earth. I don't know if you heard of it. No, it's called Night on Earth. That's what it's called. I'm not saying this is something that you that you have to watch, you know, uh, <laughs> but um, it made made a lasting impression on me. It came out in the 90s and it's about um, it's basically night sets in and it's all about cab drivers or taxi drivers in various places of the world, Los Angeles, New York um, and Finland, of course, Helsinki. Yeah. And and it's always a short story in Rome and so on and about what happens actually in a in a cab while a person is being driven from the airport to home and it's it's about cultural things so so how things yeah how different things are in different cultures it's it's kind of, it's very hilarious um, it's it's not not very intellectual but it's kind of funny and. And especially also the Finland part uh, made me think a lot. So it was was when I was about to go to Finland, and so so many of the prejudices that that were kind of um, conveyed uh, by the movie, I found them sort of vindicated. Actually, I, I, the premise sounds actually really good. <laughs> I guess I sort of go to probably give, I probably will give it a go. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, so that's favorite film. Do you have a favorite Christmas film? Love oh, actually, <laughs> love. Ah, oh, good choice. <laughs> That's it, what you mean. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, love actually is a. Uh, yes, uh, you'll have my vote on that. <laughs> we are nearly up to the hour mark. Uh, I, I just got a few other quick questions to sure. ask. Five questions. How large is your research group now? Well, I have two, uh, but they are both small. So I work with about, um, I would say, four people in in both groups. There are, so we are here organized as kind of departments, but they are not departments in a, in a sense that you, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a English or, or American sense. Um, I have people that I work very closely with, um, like three PhD students here in Göttingen and another two PhD students in Heidelberg. And then I have chemists who work quite independently. I'm, I'm kind of telling them what I want to have, kind of dye or, or a certain linker and so on. And I'm kind of just coarsely steering that direction, but I'm not interfering with the daily work. Um, those people that that really work on min flux or min that and this kind of thing, I talk to every day, sometimes um, repeatedly, many times. And so I'm following them very closely. So if you ask me how large is my group, it's a difficult question. Maybe eight people, yeah, nine people. Okay. People, and if you has it always been that sort of size? Or no, it... It, it was it was larger at times. Yeah, uh, uh, around I would say between two thousand six and and ten, um, many more uh, many more people were in my groups. Um, actually, maybe maybe thirty forty or so. Uh, but now it's it's much smaller because I like to work with few selected people. So all the people that I have, I would say without exception, are really very very good. People who could make an academic career if they wanted. Yeah. From, no, from their skills that's the and so I, I enjoy that because i can work with them and they are effective and they they um i can some influence of course the work and and vice versa so so i really like that much better so i think this is one of the privileges once you have the nobel you're not forced to 
the churn out papers and, and, and things like that. And honestly, I don't worry much about whether it's coming out in nature, science, or I don't know what. Yeah, of course, if, if we can publish it there, we do. But but I think um, if it's an archive somewhere, that's for me, then the job is sort of done for me, more or less. That's how I see it. Uh so actually, on, on the it's final questions, because te- we are up to just over the hour now. How do you find publishing? Yes, I challenging? think it changed tremendously. I it changed tremendously. Um, because what I, I'm, I think that the archive is a really, really important um, Im- improvement. Because, you know, when I published the STAT idea, and also when I had a first, um, the first experimental proof that STAT would work, um, of course, Nature and Science rejected the paper, um, by the way, um, the first step, um, um, experimental proof. And I was worried about priority, of course, because I felt uh, if it's important, then it won't matter that much where it is published, but that it is published and, and you have priority. And now, because there is archive, you always get priority on the very same and very, very day that you want. And so the journals have lost their power in um, for, for determining when you have priority. I think this is really important. This is a major change. And what they do now is, of course, they want to raise the bar for quality, whatever that is, yeah? And so it's harder to get your paper finished. They all ask all kinds of questions and you have to fill out many forms and, and this kind of stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the only thing that is left for them. I think, um, I think um, pu- publishing has changed tremendously because because you, you, everyone is now capable of, of, of getting priority basically on the day he or she wants. No, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how the next five to 10 years play out, I think. With the... Yeah, it, it's, it's going to change even more um, because, you know, I mean, if you make a big discovery, you know, a really big discovery, the only thing that matters is priority. It will be, yeah. It, I don't know where it's going. I don't think anyone knows where it's going to go. So I think we will, we'll see. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Stefan, we are, apologies, slightly over the hour, but thank you so much for joining me today. It's been fascinating to listen to in, in for many, many respects. Uh, thank you everyone who's watched or listened uh, to this podcast today, The Microscopist. You've heard some good tips with Eric's being mentioned, Richard Henderson's being mentioned, so forth. So please go and watch the others. But Stefan, thank you so much for your time today, because I know it's Limited. Thank you, Peter. Thank All the best. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.